good afternoon and welcome back to Gulfstream Park. Thank you for joining us here this afternoon on Gulfstream Today. I'm Gabby Gaudette, joined by Acacia Courtney here to look at this 11 race program. And we were just talking before we came on, we've got a lot of things to cover, a lot of topics to go over. And first and foremost, I wanted to remind everybody that uh, we do not have live racing next weekend, next week, excuse me, from Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We do resume racing on Thursday. Thursday afternoon. Of course, uh, the Phasic Tipton sale is going on next week. You can come out on Monday morning and catch the Bree show, and then you can come back on Wednesday evening and catch the sale itself. Yeah, it seems like it's going to be a really fun time here. And as Gabby said, we will be dark for live racing, but the facility still will be open. So come on out Monday at 10 a.m. And then the sale is Wednesday, March 1st at 4 p.m. So make sure you come out and join. And then we do resume racing, of course, leading up to that weekend, which will be Fountain of Youth day so lots of big stuff coming up we have so many stakes next <laughs> saturday so i think we get a little bit of a reprieve this weekend of course we do are headlined by grade three tomorrow but uh, and some undercard stakes as well but uh, going full force um, ramping up for fountain of youth weekend it's going to be an exciting weekend next week and talking about excitement well yesterday it surely was exciting i think it happened it happens frequently the friday before guaranteed pool in the picks <laughs> Six. They always take it down and uh, hats off to the lucky winners yesterday. Actually, reading a press release, the uh, pick six was taken down by a group of 12 guys who come out to Gulfstream and their yearly trek, and it seemed to be a pretty prosperous yearly trek. They, they were. They were up in one of the suites from Jim Beam. There were 12 of them. They put $20 uh, each together, and uh, the pick six combination did pay over $324,000, so pretty good. I guess that two years ago, they missed it by one race and it was only in the last leg that they got knocked out and this year they did hit it and it was pretty exciting seeing some videos floating around on Twitter to see them cheering upstairs uh, on the third floor so congratulations and can't wait to see what you do next year. Wow, and you know what? <laughs> it was a very difficult sequence yes, to was. take down. We had so many big prices within the sequence, and overall, the ticket cost $194.40. That right there is impressive. Yes, it is. So whoever was putting the tickets together, great job. Great job, because <laughs> I didn't come anywhere near that. And I don't think Ron Nicoletti did either. <laughs> um, it was a big day yesterday as well for Jose Ortiz. He had four winners on yesterday's card and reading the press release as well. That's, I think, or he didn't get five winners, but last year he had four five win days. He's had a phenomenal couple of years. He has. So I guess uh, leaving Jose Ortiz off of that rainbow six is definitely a dangerous move to make as he did, as you say, have four wins in a row yesterday. So really just been riding in great form. And it's fun to watch him because he's successful in New York. He's successful in Florida, really kind of wherever he goes. So um, really, as I said, great to see him riding here and in such great form. He ships very well. He does. He's a, he's a good shipper. He travels well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to uh, looking towards tomorrow afternoon. Of course, we have 13 races on tap, three stakes, one graded stake. And I wanted to mention some of those guaranteed pools. We will have guaranteed pools tomorrow in the late pick four. That is a $350,000 guarantee in the uh, pick five as well. That's a $250,000 guarantee. And we did say we had uh, yesterday that uh, we would have a guarantee in the pick six if it was not hit for $400,000. Scratch that off but we will have a guaranteed pool of 200,000 in the pick six tomorrow. So don't want to miss out on those. We have 13 races tomorrow. First post will be at noon and of course highlighted by grade three and two non-graded stakes. So should be a great day and it is not an easy couple of sequences to put together either, but We'll try our best as always. We will try our best, and I hope you try your best this <laughs> afternoon because today, once again, is Beat the Expert Day, our favorite or least favorite day of the week. I'm not uh, sure. Well, we're still trying to figure it out, but I am up to back today for Beat the Expert. And, you know, it's a lot of pressure. It's not easy, um, but it is. Uh, it really has been popular, and we love having people play and say that they're playing. Seen some people saying on Twitter that they're joining us this week. So you have until first post today, which is 12.35 p.m., 66 minutes to first post to get your picks in, 11 races today. So go to our Facebook page or Golf Stream Park website. You could win one of the great polo shirts that say you beat the expert. 
And I thought especially the latter half of the card is really competitive and it's going to be a tough uh, beat the expert day, but best of luck to you, Acacia. You. I know, I, and I say this with full disclosure, a couple weeks ago when I did it, I had one winner <laughs> out of 11 races and I think Ron might have done it last time. And I Friday. did the same thing last time that I was me. Now's yeah. the time to turn things around. Now's the time, yes. <laughs> I, I will do my best to make a good showing for all of us and hopefully get us off the duck. Today is the day, Acacia, as we <laughs> will transition into today's card. I wanted to show you some of our featured wagers today. And of course, we always kick things off in today's opener with that rolling super high five. 2404 in that carryover in race one. Race one also starts the 50 cent early pick five. Acacia will have a ticket for that. Moving right along to the rainbow six. That does start in today's sixth race. Again, just mentioning taking it down yesterday afternoon. So we start from scratch today in the rainbow six. <coughs> and that late pick five does start in race seven. That is a 50 cent base wager. We'll have tickets for all of those featured wagers. But today, we are fast and firm on the turf with 11 races, and we kick things off at 12.35 p.m. first post. And it was a quirky day yesterday in terms of winners. We had a lot of big-priced winners. And I would say that it uh, the, the track, both the turf and the main track, kind of shifted. Mm -hmm. We saw it really favor maybe speed types, especially on the turf, uh, a couple weeks prior to yesterday. But I thought yesterday it was pretty fair. It was. And, excuse me, we did have some pretty significant rain a couple of days ago. So let's taking that into account. But you can see we are fast and firm again today. Definitely think that the turf course and probably the main track as well needed a little bit of the rain. And it did look fairly even across the board yesterday. Let's go now to that 50 cent early pick five, Acacia. Let's see your ticket. All right, give you a look at my ticket in here. Trying to keep things affordable. I do have a single, just two deep here to start things off. Four deep in the second race, uh, two in the third. And my single will come with breakaway in the fourth race for Armando de la Cerda. Um, I hope that this mayor can get uh, the win in here today. And then four deep in the fifth, $32 today. And we start things off in the opener at six furlongs on the main track for the 62.50 non-winners of three lifetime condition. And mm -hmm. right now, early money landing to the five. Summer Whites, that's where you opt for. And uh, Summer Whites back into the barn of Murat Sankal. And uh, I've kind of had a, a little bit of a love-hate relationship with this filly. It's like you... you you do try to get her home. Sometimes you think she might be the lone speed. And I actually thought that that, that she would um, really first off the claim for Antonio Sano last time out fair pretty well. And she did run OK. She has some speed. And she finished third last time. Um, I do kind of wonder, though, today, who else will really pressure her? Because I think that there is some other potential speed in here. But I don't know if it's ever trustworthy. Now, the six Palmera before the layoff used to show quite a bit of speed. Last time out, she was off a big layoff off for Ralph Nick, so you don't know what she's going to do today because she didn't show any gate speed last time out. Miss Steffi has shown some speed uh, on other surfaces. I'm not sure how she will sprinting on the dirt. So I landed on Summer Whites again today. Paco Lopez is back in the saddle, and I think that he does actually handle her very well, and one of her better recent performances was with him aboard. She seems to be the horse to beat. She's just one of the more consistent horses in here, and beyond her, you look at a horse like Pomera, who, as you said, was coming off a lengthy layoff last time out and did not fire and did not show any speed that she used to show prior to the layoff. So I thought that was a big cause for pause there just because of the the fact that we didn't see any speed from her. But we did see dancing wind in that race. She went um, wire to wire. She won easily. She had won easily against lower level claimers prior to that too. Maybe another step down in class will help her, but she's a very lightly raced five-year-old mare. So I'm going with a very weird horse and uh, the seven charming fantasy. I'm just going to give one more shot and <laughs> I'm not afraid to because at least you'll get a decent price on a horse like this. Um, she has decent back class. You can see actually at Gulfstream in September and even over the summer, she was facing higher level maiden claimers. They dropped her down to the bottom and she pretty much ran off the screen by three lengths. She came back to repeat against non-winners of two lifetime comp co company. That was for Stanley Gold. Now, last time out was the first time for Dave Fox, and she really just broke sideways into um, another horse immediately coming out of the gate. I didn't think it would kind of warrant a performance that 
bad, but who knows if there was any kind of um, something that happened after uh, that poor break. So I'm going to give her one more shot. I like the fact that Tyler Gaffleon hops in the saddle. She does get some class relief, too, going from the 12.5 to the 62.50 non-winners of three in here. She did kind of win against tougher non-winners of two a couple starts back, but last time, I agree, she was uh, bumped and took a little bit of a right turn at the break. There was actually a horse to her outside that unseated the rider, but I don't think she was affected by that, and then she just didn't show anything after that. So that's why I took a wait and see, but you certainly will get a better price after that race. <laughs> and hopefully we get a little bit of a price to kick off the early uh -huh. pick five as well as we'll <laughs> take a look to the second race on the card and $30,000 claiming event seven furlongs onto the main track. And we'll start with the number two Padilla, uh, your top selection for Aubrey Marat. And I believe we have a stat for this type of move. We do. And this horse is a little bit of a question here. Probably will take some money with John Velasquez in the saddle though, but going from turf to dirt in claiming race, races. Uh, Aubrey Mirage is 17% win, 44% in the money, and a 231 ROI. And now this horse actually has had uh, some relatively strong races on the dirt, does have a win on the dirt, and he has a, a strong um, numbers. His best buyer speed figure on the dirt was an 84. So he has been running against uh, turf types even going one turn two turns and, and against some pretty tough company as well even trying stakes company and faring pretty well um, his only recent dirt start was in the slop in the claiming crown of 2015 so there's a bit of difficult things to go off of but i saw that speed uh, excuse me i saw that stat and the dam was a dirt sprinter so giving this one a try today and i you're right i mean if he can go back to his performance on the main track at golf stream back in august of 2000 2015, where he did run that 81 buyer speed figure. Um, he could be competitive against this competition today. His most recent dirt start was on a sloppy sealed track back in December of 2015. He's been in form since returning to the races, but that's been on the turf, and I just question whether or not well, why run a horse so frequently on the turf? He's, it's clearly a more preferred surface for him. So I thought that there were better horses in here to maybe try to beat him. Um, I don't have a lot of confidence with the four midnight cello mm -hmm. but this is a horse who definitely has faced tougher company in the past he's faced grade three company in the ak ak grade three company in the hanshin um, actually on the synthetic at arlington just quality stakes company but i guess you have to question is he the same horse as he once was as he's sitting on two really subpar performances followed by a pretty lengthy layoff he is and he's actually a grade three winner so you talk about back class and he certainly does have have that especially looking at the rest of this field but uh, he's taking a very significant drop in class from two hundred thousand dollar stakes company on the synthetic also his last two poor performances are both separated by some pretty lengthy layoffs so that's why i kind of was a little bit hesitant about him but look you definitely have to respect him off of that class and off of the fact that he does actually have a good record here at Gulfstream. he's had five starts here a win two seconds and a third so i, I think that he's a horse to maybe take into account, um, but he will really have to prove himself. But maybe his class is just going to carry him through. I will be honest with you. <laughs> I had a really tough time with uh -huh. this race because we have horses in here that do have back class like him um, who we haven't seen and might be tailing off, headed in the wrong direction. But we also have horses who just don't really like to win that often. <laughs> um, but one horse perhaps could be the number seven Moonlight Bandit to the outside, a horse that you throw in second. First off to claim for Jorge Navarro. And I feel like there's a little bit of a claiming war. <laughs> here. Uh, Jorge Navarro is claiming off Safi Joseph Jr. and vice versa as of late. They are, and they're actually both doing well with <laughs> claiming off of each other. So that's why I had some interest with this horse. And I didn't show this stat, but first off the claim with blinkers added, Jorge Navarro is four for 10 winning and six for 10 in the money with a positive ROI. And I think that this horse might show some improved speed with the addition of blinkers too, because he's always kind of been forwardly placed. And that's what I uh, maybe had some more interest in him for. This is a wide open field. Even the one, the great Casby, comes out of a sneaky bad trip. He was kind of stuck down on the inside rail and uh, didn't really have a lot of room to run. Somehow he found a, a small seam, but the successful horses were closing out in the center of the track. And we've been kind of talking about how Jorge Ruiz has just uh, how great and he's been riding in such great form, especially for Louis Duco. So maybe another uh, horse to consider at 15 to one, but a very competitive <laughs> second.
basket race, and you can see where we've got like a rainbow on the bottom of the screen. And there's only seven horses. I it's know. not even a big field. So maybe if you can go a little bit deeper in that race, it might be one to do it. If you have an opinion, well, then by all means, mm -hmm. bet away, because <laughs> I don't really have a strong opinion in that particular yeah. race. We'll get to the third race on the card, a maiden 12,500 <coughs> event, seven furlongs there onto the main track. And Acacia, you land to the outside, a horse's name that I don't <laughs> like, Poopsie Doopsie. It's a, it's a very, yeah, I don't know, for this three-year-old filly. But anyway, for trainer Dave Braddy, she had a tough post last time out when she had dropped to this bottom level maiden claiming company. She actually started out with some some relatively promising races in special weight company, dropped to the maiden 25, and then last time out off of about a four-month layoff as well, dropped to this 12-5 level. Um, Miguel Vasquez stays aboard. Now, she's still drawn to the outside, but she does get blinkers added, and I hope that that... Uh, helps her in two ways. I hope that it helps her be even more forwardly placed and that it does help her uh, finish finish up better because she was very wide last time out as well. And she could definitely win this race. They have no knocks against her. She could potentially be a short price though. The five, I'm thirsty. This will be the second start for Jorge Navarro. And I know that we've kind of run some stats uh, lately about Jorge Navarro acquiring horses, not necessarily claiming them, but acquiring mm -hmm. them off of previous connections. And Alfred McIntosh was one of them. He hasn't had a great amount of success. So I'm interested to see these horses running back second off the aqua position. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that she's got a good sound bottom underneath of her at the one turn mile, now cutting back to today's distance, and she gets to a fast main track. So I do think that that's a better surface for her. Prior to that, she was facing a pretty salty competition in Worth Avenue. Worth Avenue's blown um, kind of that level of competition away each and every time. They stepped her up recently and mm -hmm. she was defeated, but she has been a, a filly that's been in good form. She has, and especially at that level, as you mentioned. So it was a significant drop in class with the barn switch too, but she gets back to the fast main track. Paco Lopez in the saddle. This will also be her second start with the blinkers, so she does have every reason to take a step forward. Though I do like one horse before we move on, and that's the one tricky moon. I thought a horse that could be overlooked. 15 to 1 on the morning line, draws the rail today, and I think we'll see more speed from her today because she actually hopped at the start and then she was really green, taking a lot of dirt in her face. She was throwing her head all over the place. Didn't look like that's where she wanted to be, but with the rail post and maybe a cleaner break today, um, I'm hoping she doesn't dwell or rear uh, once again. I could see maybe an improvement from this filly, so I did decide to use her in the exacta at a big price. As we get to the fourth race, a $16,000 non-winners of three lifetime event, a mile onto the turf, and we'll go back and show you a video spotlight replay of both the two Breakaway and Voila La Victoire. Love saying that name, <laughs> <laughs> at least when I say it successfully. Uh -huh. uh, we see the three breakaway getting into some trouble there behind horses, but we also see the eight Voila La Victoire way on the outside. And I thought that she kind of made a little bit of a premature move. After that, she was wide, not really saving any ground. You kind of saw two horses. Or she could have saved maybe two spots there coming around the final turn, but a very impressive performance from Breakaway all considering that she had a check at a pivotal part of the race at the quarter pole. And not to mention, you saw it there in that replay, Luis Saez did drop his whip right as uh, after she checked. And so he's just riding her towards the finish line and was still beaten just a neck. And that's one of the reasons even still that I like this uh, mare so much here in this spot. She did win two starts back and I thought that she had the trouble, uh, of course, losing the whip and not being able to urge her on in that way uh, towards the finish line. So. I think that she really could be sitting on another big performance. And um, minus the hiccup a couple starts back where she did clip heels and lose her rider, both horse and rider were just fine after that. She's been ultra consistent mm -hmm. in her past several starts. So really like her, Voila, Vi La, Voila La Victoire has been, it's a tongue twister, has I've been very, <laughs> <it many times. laughs> has been consistent too. But unfortunately, she's kind of been consistent finishing in the money. Yeah, she hasn't won in quite some time. She's starting to rack up those defeats. She's two for 20. Her last victory was in April of 2016 against non-winners of two for 25 at Aqueduct. So I did bump her down a little bit lower on the ticket, but a horse that you and I both liked at a good price is the four, Ali Cruz, um, who I thought last time out stretching from the seven and a half to the mile distance 
overall, it was a pretty slow pace going the mile, and she looked like she was ranked kind of the first half of the race, hard to settle. I think it's going to be a different circumstance today, and it kind of had to dig through her, her PPs a little bit, mm -hmm. but I do think that she's capable of, of running a race that you could put her in for some exotics. I totally agree. I think that if you do kind of look back and maybe cross off some of her races, then you are able to see that you're left with a horse that perhaps does fit this level of competition. And she will be, uh, I think, a little bit closer to the pace because it did look like she wanted to do more early last time out. Well, that is race four as we turn the page to the fifth and allowance optional claimer. We're going seven furlongs onto uh, the main track. And uh, we kind of see things similarly, but a, <laughs> a little bit differently in terms of order. You did go to the two conquest super step here for Mark Cassie, um, who I believe we have a stat on. We do. I used this horse in second. I couldn't end up putting her on top. I do think that you have to respect her, but we'll show a stat on trainer Mark Cassie. Uh, going from route to sprint on the dirt, after a 61 to 180 day layoff. It's just four for 21, and it is a negative ROI, just of 78 cents. And this horse, she used to show quite a bit of speed, and she definitely has some back class, of course, being second by just ahead in state Fred Stakes competition back at Saratoga in 2015. Um, and then she's kind of been running okay, consistent races. Uh, she is cutting back to the sprint distance, though, and that's kind of what I do wonder. Tactically, uh, I think that she might be maybe be just sitting in a good spot to be able to grab a share, but I, I couldn't end up putting her on top in here. I like her better going two turns on the dirt, and that's why I kind of threw her in the bottom half of the ticket, just because I think she settles better in terms of her speed. She has a lot of natural speed, but it seems like she's just on the engine the entire time going one turn, whereas her better races, I think, come at even nine furlongs on the main track, as you saw previously at Saratoga. So I will take the wait and see on her, but the four Polly's Express she has tried seven eights before. That was at Saratoga back in August, and we haven't seen her since November, but she's a very consistent type of uh, mare here. She's incredibly consistent. She has had a win, a second, a win, and a third, so really not too bad of a resume in her four starts so far. She does have John Velasquez in the saddle, which is always a good thing to see. So she's coming off of a three-month freshening, but last time out, um, and even looking at her buyer speed figure, she's been pretty consistent too. Now, it does seem that maybe Maybe after a big win, she might regress a little bit, but last time out, she finished third, and it was behind a horse named Indulgent, who did go on to win her next two races, getting an 84 and an 82 buyer speed figure, respectively, in the no those next two. One of two in here for Ralph Nix. He also has the one crowning affair to the rail, um, who's been relatively consistent as well, but I did prefer Polly's Express. And if you see Polly's Express and the numbers that she's been running, they're kind of much better than the rest of the field, but she has only four races and she is a five-year-old mare, so she's had a lot of starts and stops throughout her career. So I would say that that is really her own um, uh, negative here on form, but the six Curlin's image, she is a winner at this distance, and that actually came two starts back when she broke her maiden. Now, I am on the fence about her, but she is five to one, and she's an alternative to the favorite here. Her win, she managed to go to the lead. She was uncontested. She went wire to wire, average fractions. She drew off her way from the field. Um, I don't think she's going to get that situation today. I think there's a lot of other horses in here that have equivalent or even faster speed in here. And she was kind of on the engine last time out. But I like the fact that she's proven herself at the distance. She's outside of most of the speed, so she could probably just let everything kind of unfold in, in, underneath of her. And I think that's kind of what she'll have to do because she does look like the main horse in here that needs the lead. While there may be some other speed types, I think that she is way more comfortable when she's on the front end. So she will have to um, be positioned in the right way by Nick Juarez in here. Well, that is races one through five, that early pick five. We're going to step aside, take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll tackle the 20 cent rainbow six and the late pick five right after this. <laughs> Racester's the leader by one. Here's the finish. Racester, wire to wire. And Sir Dudley Diggs from a beast gizmo. Sir Dudley Diggs has won the Queen's Plate.
Saturday, March 4th, the road to the Triple Crown continues at Gulfstream Park. Don't miss the country's top three-year-olds compete in the Grade 2 ExpressBet.com Fountain of Youth Stakes as they continue their journey to Derby glory. Nine total stakes races, $1.5 million on the line, a thrilling day of live racing. The Grade 2 Fountain of Youth Stakes. Derby contenders start here. Welcome to your playground, Gulfstream Park. The Fountain of Youth is coming up. That is next Saturday, and tis the season, Derby prep season. Everything is kind of falling into place. Really excited about that, too. But really excited about the 20 cent rainbow six today. It was taken down yesterday by 12 very lucky individuals. So we start from scratch here today, but I did come up with a ticket and I did find a single today. Today is $57.60. My single doesn't come until way later on the card and that's the number three, Sean. And still that is guesswork because the <laughs> horse has never tried uh, the main track before, but it is a Todd Pletcher horse. And in Todd, we trust sometimes <laughs> I couldn't, I like the horse because I didn't really like anything else in the race, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying it. And I needed to spread in both the 11th race and the 9th race. I thought those were really competitive races. We've got, especially in the 9th race, we have some really classy mares who are coming back off of layoffs. If they can fire off the layoff, they, some of them could win. Um, also horses who've been um, really in good form as of late. So we started off with the 6, and that is 7.5 furlongs onto the turf. and. I didn't necessarily like the two Leonardo da Vinci, but I use him protectively <laughs> to start things off. And I do think that he's a horse that you have to use. And we'll show a stat on trainer Safi Joseph Jr. And we were kind of alluding to this earlier. Now, this is just in the past 90 days, first off the claim. I wanted to show this. He's it's either win or they don't win. So he's five for <laughs> feast nine. Or famine, it's as feast we say. or famine, but he's five for nine, first off the claim, just in the past 90 days. So he's been very sharp with the horses that he has claimed. 56% win, a positive ROI as well of 262. And I, I did also look up that horses that he's claimed and Javier Castellano climbs aboard. They're two for two together, first off the claim, uh, also just recently in this meet. So it definitely is uh, something to take note of and I think uh, you're doing the right move of not leaving this horse off your ticket. I don't know if he has to win today but I do think you have to use him protectively. He is one that I've liked for quite some time and I, I've picked him so frequently I didn't pick him last time out and he won <laughs> but I think the reason why he won was he sat a beautiful trip under Julian Leperu stalking right behind two horses who were dueling in front of him. Those two horses kind of stopped he made his move, and he, he he didn't let a horse closing from off of the pace beat him. He looked like he actually gained more confidence when he was on the lead. He's not really that fast, but I wonder if that is his more preferred running style, maybe closer to the pace rather than closing from off of it. So that was one thing I did notice about his performance. We'll see how it kind of shakes out today. But as you said, Safi Joseph Jr.'s horse is off the claim. They've been looking great in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And as you said, a potent duo there with Javier Castellano in the saddle. I go to the outside to the number nine, Xander. Not only do I like this horse, but it's also the same uh, name as my dog back at home. So of course, a little hunch bit bet. of a hunch, hunch bet, bet, right? <laughs> um, but Mike Maker, Jose Ortiz in the saddle. Jose coming off of a four win day yesterday. And this horse is taking a pretty significant drop in class. And it, it doesn't really surprise me. We've seen Mike Maker have success with this move so far at the meet. And he, as, just as you said, he, he's very good at placing horses where they can be successful. This. So this course comes off a little bit of a dud at fairgrounds last time out. And of course, a big dud two starts back when unfortunately he was eased and walked off. But that was against much tougher company than what he's going to face today. And he's actually um, even previously early on in his career, he was facing some even tougher company. And he does have a little bit of back class to him. Now, it is a long time in between drinks. His last race was that he won was in June of 2015. But I think on the drop and with the connections, just as we've been saying a lot for 
frequently leave Mike Maker and Jose Ortiz off at your own risk. <laughs> and the horse is a good price, too. Mm -hmm. uh, the five Bridge of Luck we both used a bit, and I think it's worth noting um, the fact that this horse has shown a lot of improved speed mm -hmm. since the layoff in both his turf start at nine furlongs, two starts back, and even last time out on the main track. He did, and that's actually just exactly the comment that I had in here. So now he gets back to the turf today. His last turf start, two starts back, where he did show a lot of improved speed was going nine furlongs last time out. It was on that sealed sloppy track at a mile and a 16th. So we'll see what he does at the seven and a half here today. But Trevor McCarthy, named to ride for Del Capuano. And if he continues with that kind of speed, that really could be to his benefit. Well, let's hope we have the right three here, because <laughs> those are the only three I use to kick off the 20 cent rainbow six as we turn the page to the seventh on the card. It does start the 50 cent late pick five at six furlongs on the main track. Acacia, how did you see the sequence? No single for me in the late pick five had my single earlier on today but we'll show you my ticket i'm using three horses in here i thought this thirty-five thousand dollar claiming race was a, a relatively tough one in here so three deep there two and then i'm also spreading in the ninth race i totally agree with you there so using four horses in the ninth uh two in the tenth i am using sean but also backing myself up with meadow rose and then two deep in the finale forty eight dollars okay and you use five six eight to start things off i have three one <laughs> so that <laughs> so that's just, the kind of race that you got here yeah that <laughs> just goes to show, show you but i really did want to use more horses in this leg of the sequence because i thought that you could make a case for several horses one of them being the six hour sarge who you prefer in here for eddie please i do and this horse is 10 to 1 on the morning line so i was looking at the first leg of the pick five trying to maybe get a price or a horse perhaps that I could maybe put a little bit more emphasis in looking at some of the back races. So our Sarge does get in with a lightweight, Carlos Hernandez in the saddle and two starts back at what I think was the right level for this horse at the $35,000 maiden level, showed a lot of speed. Last time out, didn't really show that much speed, but he was running against a really nice runner in Barry Carafin Betts, who did prove himself finishing second in a stake. And it was also against 50,000 starter allowance company. I think it was two tough for our Sarge and I like him much better in here. In terms of top selections, I took a little bit of a pause with horses who should or need to be forwardly placed. Um, we look at the overall pace scenario in here. I think Love Conquers will show speed from the rail. Um, Vessendor has actually had speed previously. We have our Sarge, who you were just mentioning, has speed. And also Crack and John from the outside. And a lot of the time we say, all right, all these horses have speed. It doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes the one will just shoot out of the gate and wire the field. Um, but I still, am, uh, I still am kind of leaning more towards horses who will be closing from off of the pace, and one of them being the three John Raider here for Wesley Ward. This horse is coming off of a layoff since July, but Wesley Ward has no problem getting horses fit and ready off of the layoff. He is dropping in class. I think it's the right move considering it was just an average field that he faced against Maiden Special Weight Company prior to the layoff. And he sets up to close from off of it. He certainly could, and he's been training sharply since at Palm Meadows. And I looked at this horse for a really long time and ended up kind of taking the wait and see approach with him in here. If I could have gone deeper, this would have been uh, the place to do it. But as you said, it was kind of um, not a, an overly impressive field that he did face in his maiden win, and he, he didn't show anything in his debut. It was actually on a good track last time out that he did win, but now he's gelding, he's off the layoff, and he's trying the turf for the, or excuse me, he's uh, on the main turf, main track again. He's been training on the turf, probably for fitness coming off that layoff. So I do respect him. You mentioned the number eight, Crack and John to the outside. I think that he's going to be the speed of the speed. It definitely looks like perhaps he and Love Conquers will probably be the sharpest out of the gate if everything goes right. I could definitely see that, and maybe it, that's why I kind of like the three to close and then the, <laughs> the one love conquers to maybe just shoot it out of the gate and hope for the best and go wire to wire because there are some speed types in between him and Crack and John to the outside. So Crack and John could uh, maybe be caught wide or what have you. So that's why I kind of saw it um, in that way. And I also wanted a new face with horses who've been 
competing against each other like Vencedor, uh, Charlie the Greek, Crack and John, just several horses. So it is a tough race, obviously. We're all over the map <laughs> there on the bottom half of the screen to kick off the pick five. We'll get to the eighth race, a 50 cent late pick four, five furlongs on the turf for this allowance optional claimer. And we'll start off with um, a performance that we saw both Scuba Sue and Ela come out of. This was two starts back for Scuba Sue, but it was actually Ela's last performance. She's been freshened since the 5th of January. And this was a race handicapping. We were thinking, all right, there's going to be a crazy amount of speed in here. They're going to go winging and dinging on the front end. And honestly, all that happened was Ela and Scuba Sue went to the front end, and they didn't go that quickly. They went 22 and change, 46 flat for the half two. I thought it was a good performance from Ela. The reason why I think she could turn the tables today, she doesn't have to draw the rail today. She doesn't have to draw the rail. And as you said, she has been freshened while Scuba Sue has had one more race after that. She did finish a very respectable second last time out. And she was actually kind of cool on the tote board too, considering her consistency. So I respect both of these mares in here. Um, I did go with the number six glass house and I talked about Wesley Ward in the last race. We'll talk about him again here today. This horse came off of a big layoff last time out and I did actually think that she might perform well last time. She finished an okay third in there, um, but I think that perhaps she might have needed that race. She's been working really sharply since on the Palmetto turf course. Now she hasn't won since 2015. And that was back in Ireland. But as I said, there were some gaps since she shipped over from Europe. So second off the layoff, Joel Rosario in the saddle. Two things that worry me about Glass House, and look, I took a really aggressive approach and just leaving her <laughs> off my top four and even my pick six ticket. Uh, two things, usually Wesley Ward horses coming off the layoff, they fire. And if they don't, they don't fire second off the layoff. It usually takes them a, a couple of starts to kind of get back into the form. You see his statistics first off mm -hmm. the layoff, they're, o they're often good, mm -hmm. um, and they kind of take a little bit of a dip second off the layoff. Second reason why I'm a little bit apprehensive to pick her is because she's been having issues breaking from the gate. She did at Keeneland. She didn't break very well, and you can't see it in the short comment, but she broke last last time out, and she didn't look like she had really that closing kick to her. Um, it's really key at five furlongs here to break well. Especially at that short distance, as you said, and five and a half furlongs at Keeneland. She had the extended layoff after that. So we'll see how she does second off the layoff. By no means would I single her in here. I talked about respecting the other two, but thought maybe she might be able to move forward, especially with an improved post today. But she does have to get out sharply from the gate in here. Um, and I did throw on the, as did you, the number eight crazy about Jazz facing winners for the first time. But I think that she's got some speed as well so it will be interesting to see how the pace scenario shakes out at this five furlong sprint because we do have I think a lot of other speed in this race. We were just talking about it Scuba Sue, Ela, and then Crazy Bat Jazz looks like she prefers the lead too so uh, it will be interesting to see how that pace scenario shakes out in the eighth. We'll get to the ninth race seven and a half furlongs onto the turf for this allowance optional claimer and this was the race I was <laughs> alluding to earlier today a very very competitive turf race full of horses who have a lot of back class that we haven't seen and full of horses who have put in good races recently. So we'll start off by going to the most recent performance from the number 11 Frosty Friday who figures to take money off of her last race. This was in the sunshine on Sunshine Millions Day, the Sunshine Millions Philly and Mare Turf. And this was her second start off the layoff. She won first off the layoff back in December. We hadn't seen her since August prior to that. And this was, I thought, a very game performance. Unfortunately, fa family meeting was just a touch better for Tom Proctor. But you could see it was a two-horse race coming down the stretch. E.B. Ryder did finish third, but it was a distant third. A distant third at that. And I respect Frosty Friday after that performance because she really did put in a tough performance in that race. But now, as you said, she'll be um, third off the layoff. She did win first off the layoff on a, a turf that was labeled good, so had a little bit more moisture in it, but last time out. And you do kind of wonder what last that last race maybe took out of her after that because she was just going so uh, tough towards the wire there. So I see that you even took the pass on her. I used her in third today, so we'll see how she bounces back after that. And uh, I also think she finds much tougher competition here too. And one of them is the nine, Jaws DeSanimo, 
first time for trainer Ralph Nix, who has been doing great work with some of these new acquisitions, and she's got the credentials to back it up. She does. I remember really liking her in the Panama City this uh, this fall at a price, and she ended up winning that race uh, impressively, closing from off of it. And she seems versatile as well. She's shown some speed. I think that closing uh, does look to be perhaps a little bit more preferred for her, but you mentioned how Ralph Nix has been do doing well and at some good prices to um, a, a acquiring horses. Luca Panici rode this horse last time out. He's going to ride her again. So she is off of about a four-month freshening, but she's been running in graded stakes company prior mm -hmm. to that. A very, very classy filly here. Mayor, excuse me, and she looks like she's been having an excellent work tab too. We'll get to my top selection in a second, but the seven Peru for Christophe Clement won fresh off the layoff last time out, and I believe we wanted to show a statistic for this move. We do, because sometimes you wonder first off the layoff if a horse does win, will they regret so second off the layoff with winners last time out on the turf. That doesn't really normally seem to be the case for Christophe Clement. 23% win, 48% in the money, and a positive ROI of 217. So a very classy filly that came from the barn of Hugo Palmer, about five months off. And the second place finisher, something else, did come back to win with an 81 buyer speed figure next time. So I do respect her in here, and it is a tough race, though. And she's a little handy type of filly. She's uh, not very big in size. It doesn't look like she wants any more than maybe seven and a half furlongs or the mile. So this is a really key distance for her where maybe some other fillies and mares off the layoff might want farther than seven and a half. And the classiest horses are drawn to the outside. So that's why I go to the inside <laughs> with the one inside out for Marty Wolfson. She was blocked the majority of the stretch last time out. And you look at her race in the grade three Marshalls River. That was her first time getting to the turf since the layoff and for the Marty Wolfson barn. It was a big performance. She was beaten just over two lengths behind Sandiva, Seacoast, Isabella Sings, graded stakes winners. And I think she just might luck out today with the real post. And last time out, she was uh, just beaten about three lengths last time behind Somersault, who's been in excellent form. So she is, I think, one to use as well. I used all four of those in the pick five. It's a tough <laughs> race. We'll get more into it later. The 10th race is another tough race. And this is a two other than allowance optional claim or going the one turn mile on the main track. And we'll start off with a spotlight replay of the seven Meadow Rose. This was the first time on conventional dirt for this four-year-old filly by Ghost Zapper, um, trained by Nick Gonzalez. Javier Castellano was in the saddle last time out. We can see her coming down the stretch. She's on the outside. We have Mo Green, the eventual winner, down on the inside. It looks like she's going to absolutely blow past Mo Green, but she doesn't. It looks like she wants to wait on the other filly to her inside. Mo Green, tenacious, coming back and just getting her at the wire. That race was impressive, but it worried me a little bit. It worries <laughs> me too, for sure. And I couldn't end up putting her on top because of that. And uh, I do think that she's been consistent. And now shipping down from Woodbine, trying the main track for the first time, last time out. So she's got that race under her belt. Maybe she will move forward. But the horse that both of us like, and I know is your single, is the three Sean for uh, trainer Todd. Pletcher and I remember this horse looking very good last time out. I was off on the uh, on the turf for the Tropical Park Oaks, which was just a wide open race. It was an upset winner, but we'll show a stat on trainer Todd Pletcher going from turf to dirt, second off the layoff, going a route of ground. He's 34% win, 55% in the money, and a slightly positive ROI of 203. So she shipped in her first North America race, was on the turf last time, and as I was mentioning, physically she really did look the part. She has one on the all-weather track at great in Great Britain as well as the turf. So we'll see how the surface switch goes today. Well, considering that she had such a huge performance in the Tropical Park Oaks last time out, she drew post 12 of 13, and she managed to get second, making up a tremendous amount of ground. If Todd Pletcher thinks that she might be better on the dirt, well, then I trust <laughs> him because she, her work tab has been really solid too. Her most recent work at Palm Beach Downs was 48 flat the 19th of February. February. And according to uh, Mike Welsh and the clock report, um, this uh, that was actually against Neolithic. So some really uh, a nice partner there in the work tab, really nice works too. And I don't quite trust anybody else in there. <laughs> so I did have confidence there. I am interested to see though the eight top decile come back to the main track. She was one that showed a lot of promise earlier in, in her career, obviously second in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies behind Take Charge Brandy. So 
I don't know if she's the same horse, but I'll be interested to see her come back. And uh, to quote you, that was back when Rosie Napravnik was riding. So it is, it has been a while, but she does come out of grade two company up at Woodbine last time out. We'll take a look at today's nightcap, and that is race 11 going the mile on the turf for this non-winners of two lifetime claiming event, $30,000 tag. We'll show you a spotlight replay going back um, where several horses come out of, and we see Magician's Vanity, who just doesn't really like to win <laughs> most recently, but uh, the one Kate missed was who I kind of wanted to focus on because she actually broke pretty sharply coming out of the gate letting everybody else surround her. Maybe that was instructions that, yes, let's get this filly covered up. Well, it didn't pan out too great going into the first turn because it looks like she's fine here, but then she gets into, uh, she gets in a little bit tight. And then unfortunately she has to continue to check. It looks like Jose Lascano is kind of looking around, seeing if he can check her and not shut off the path of other horses. After that, she got extremely rank, and she just kind of faded from there. We can see her uh, very wide. We saw Magician's Vanity picking up the pieces there, um, finishing third, and also Kantira finishing second. Uh, out of this race, I want the horse that had the most trouble. So that's why I went uh, to the number six, Kate Mist, first off the claim for Jane Sabelli. And that, that's uh, that's totally fair in there. And maybe I'm a little bit salty because I did pick her last time out and she had all of that trouble. I thought that she looked very unsettled after that trouble, just as you had mentioned. Uh, first off the claim is not the most fruitful move for Jane Sabelli, but of course you do respect this horse. And she was in very good form prior to that race. So I, I, d I think that she is, is one to like in here. I just kind of wanted to maybe stay away from that race and look for other opportunities, kind of a fresh face, if you will. So going to a horse that's second off the layoff, and once again in Todd Fletcher, we trust the $270,000 daughter of Malibu Moon in the forecaster, leading rider Louis Sias in the saddle, came back last time out, and she didn't really fire uh, too, too much last time, but she does get the addition of blinkers, which I really like, and second off that seven-month layoff. And we could definitely see her win the eight any given trace was a horse I'll show some attention to first off the layoff she was a good second behind the winner Judy's chance who came back to win a starter allowance next at Tampa getting a 77 fire speed figure so she really improved out of that race and I'm hoping any given trace can do the same we are just about out of time. Actually, we're past time for those one through 11 races, but I think we did a good job getting to everything. We had a lot of topics to cover this <laughs> afternoon. As always. As <laughs> always, it is Gulfstream Park of the winter. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back for those 11 races, but up next, Pete Aiello with those scratches and changes. Good luck. We have to take care of these horses that, you know, give us so much joy. Being accredited